Father, we thank you for your word <clears throat> this morning. We pray as we open it. As Corinthians tells us, now we see through a glass dimly. But then, when we're with you finally face to face. So as we look at what you've given to Israel to not only bring forth worship in the nation of the true and living God, but also to speak of yourself and your nature to them and the things that they have been directed to build. I do pray that you would open your word now, let it touch every heart in the room, and let lives be transformed from, of all things, veils and boards and even sockets. And so bless this time, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, moreover, chapter 26, verse 1, thou shalt make the tabernacle, this idea of a dwelling place, with ten curtains of fine <clears throat> twined linen, blue and purple and scarlet, with cherubims of cunning work shall you make them. Now, in the 1800s, 1880s, Jameson, Foston, and Brown here, as they go through their commentary, we're going to be doing slides in a minute there, guys, just so you know. Jameson, Foston, and Brown and their commentaries, they, uh, they note that fine twine linen, to make that, the yarn, would be, that would be suitable for twining. It was customary to beat it with clubs, to boil the thread in water, and then wring it out carefully, and that improved the whiteness of the thread, of the thread as well as the weaving quality. So, as we learned in the last few weeks, we did the Ark of the Covenant here, that object that is within the Holy of Holies. And then we covered the table of showbread that has 12 loaves on it, and 12 loaves are replaced each Sabbath. 12 loaves are baked and placed hot on the Sabbath in that structure or that table. 12 loaves are removed, and the priests are the one who eat it. Last week, we talked about the lampstand, the menorah. Uh, just amazing how it was made, beaten out of one piece of gold. That's a pretty formidable as far as a project. But now we're getting into the actual structure of the tabernacle. We'll work our way through this as we go. And so I know you woke up this morning saying, man, I cannot wait to learn about curtains. <laughs> but you will. So the first one is fine linen here, and this is what I'm talking about with fine twine linen. It has three colors, blue, which speaks of heavenly glory. Purple speaks of kingly majesty or royalty. Scarlet speaks of life or even the idea of blood because the life is in the blood. So do you know of any heavenly kings who shed blood? Cherubims shall be woven in of cunning work. Moses saw them, but for everyone else, the, the artisans making this, they didn't see <clears throat> what he saw, and yet they will weave them in, and God will anoint them to weave them in, and so for the priests who enter in, they go in and they see these beautiful curtains with these reminders of cherubim. And if you've read your Bible, you know that when you get into the presence of God, whether Isaiah 6 or even Revelation 4, one of the first things you see are these holy creatures, these winged creatures around his throne who speak of his holiness and his glory. And so cherubims, they're sewn in. The length of one curtain shall be eight and 20 cupids. How many of you have a cupid? Hold it up. Length of your fingertip to your forward, to your elbow. We're going to go with the average of about 18 and a half inches. Obviously, cupids vary depending on forearm length, but at least for workable numbers, <clears throat> that's what we're going to go with here. The length of one curtain shall be 20 and 8 cupids. That's about 42 feet long. The breadth of one cupid shall be 4 cupids. That's about 6 feet wide. Every one of the curtains shall have one measure. What do you mean? You're to make, verse 1, 10 curtains, fine twine linen. And each curtain, there are 10 individual curtains joined together, and the dimension is roughly 42 feet by 6 feet. Now, first things first, the tabernacle, using the cupid of about 18, 18 and a half inches, is about 45 feet long. The height, or sorry, the width, 15 feet. The height, both sides, 15 feet. And then, of course, in the front, there are five pillars, just so you know which way you're going. If you're looking at this, you are looking west towards this side is the west, north, obviously south, and the door itself is on the east. And so as I give you these proportions, when the first set of curtains are 42 feet long, what do they not do? Reach to the bottom. See it depicted here? I know what you're thinking. This is going to be a really long service. 
but they have about a cubit, a foot and a half off the bottom, okay? And so that's our first one. And there are 60 feet of them when you join all 10. So they go the full 45 foot length and then drop all the way down the 15 feet at the back. Everybody with me? That's why there are 10 to cover the entire structure. Okay, so we're dealing with these. So you will have 10 total curtains. How many fingers and toes hopefully do most of us have? 10 fingers, 10 toes. How many have heard of the study of numerology? Okay, a few of you. Um, numerology is a study or a discipline that is applied to numbers within the Bible, seeking to gain from the numbers perhaps additional insight or meaning as to what God is saying or what God is doing. So as we've talked about the number seven, seven days of creation, seven notes in the scale, eighth is an octave, a new beginning. We talk about where these numbers seem to imply something. And with numerology, there are folks who spend a whole lot of time on it. I'm simply gonna point out some things, not sure we can prove them, but it may be <clears throat> one day when we get to heaven, we realize every detail had meaning. But 10, 10 fingers, 10 toes speaks of completeness. You have 10 fingers or 10 toes, your hands or your feet are complete. Okay, let's consider some other things with 10. How many commandments? 10 commandments, a complete direction of man's relationship one to God and man's relationship to his neighbor. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might, and the other half, love your neighbors yourself. So in those 10 commandments, you get a complete set of directions of how to walk honorably before God and before men. Okay. Egypt was judged by God, yes? How many plagues? Complete judgment. 10. Everybody's starting to follow the logic. So 10 curtains, this complete covering here, this complete work of God through this blue, purple, and scarlet, these 10 curtains speak of the complete work of this heavenly king with his heavenly glory who, again, crimson blood. So that's an interesting number. Second, the idea of five. So he goes through and he says, verse three, the five curtains shall be coupled together one to another, and other five curtains shall be coupled together one to another. So we have five and five. They break into sections for sake of portability because you got to carry this stuff as they move. And so you have 10 pieces. You put them together. Talk about how they're latched in a minute. Five, many argue, speaks of the number of God's grace. And so five curtains and five curtains coming together complete the complete grace of God covering his redemptive work. So that gets interesting. You shall make loops of blue upon the edge of one curtain from the selvage, kind of the finished edge of the fabric where you loop and then you couple them together. From the curtain of the selvage in the coupling, and likewise shalt thou make an uttermost edge another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops shall you make in one curtain, and fifty loops shall you make in the edge of the curtain that is in the coupling of the second, <clears throat> that the loops may take hold one of another. Verse 6. And thou shalt also make 50 tatches. 50 tatches, tatches is a Celtic word for clasp, is the idea, or buckle. The word in the Hebrew is caress. Try it. Caress, which speaks of a hook or a sense something to join together. And so you will make 50 tatches of gold and couple the curtains together with the tatches, and it shall be one tabernacle. Now, what does the gold or the metal gold represent? First place. Yeah, besides that. Deity. How many have heard of the year of Jubilee? How many years are they apart? Fifty. Seven sevens, the fiftieth year. It is a time of release. So, fifty, release. Five, God's grace. Ten, complete. There will be, by God's grace, a complete release given to men. See, once again, interesting things to consider, but we got to wait till we get to heaven to find out for sure. I plan to sign up for Tabernacle 101 as a course. If I do well enough, maybe I'll get the, you know, the, the permission to take the 201 and work my way through, but there's a lot he's trying to tell us here. 50, could have been 20, could have been 40, 50 hooks, Jubilee, gold hooks, deity. And so you will join these together with the tatches, and so it shall be one tabernacle. These join together, these ten, and make one complete covering. And thou shalt make the curtains of goat's hair to be a covering upon the tabernacle. Now, wait a second, so we did that one. Now the next one, the white layer here in our diagram, goat's hair. 
What are some other hairs that can be used to make tents? Camel, even sheep or wool, right? You can do that as well. If you get a chance to be introduced to the Bedouins, the Bedouins have black tents for wintertime because they are warmer. And they have camel hair, light tan for summertime because they are cooler. So you can depend on a picture to figure out what time of season if they're, being, if they're following that practice. Now, if they also have like, you know, structures there, they don't keep up with it. But if they're truly migrant Bedouin, you can basically get an idea of what season are you in, depending if they carry both tents. So that's helpful. So it could have been goat's hair, could have been wool, lamb's wool or something. I mean, it could have been camel hair or lamb's wool, but it's goat's hair. He's very specific. Goat's hair. You shall make a covering upon their tabernacle, verse 7. Eleven curtains shalt thou make. How many know what's in Genesis chapter 11? Uh, words? Nice, nice try. It's good. Okay, well, let's try this. Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations, where all the nations after the ark spread around the face of the earth. Once again, 10 complete record of man's migration. That gets interesting. Chapter 11, they were told to fill the face of the earth again, multiply, be fruitful, but they decided to all stick around in one area. Where was it? Babylon. So what did God do? Chapter 11 of Genesis, he confused or divided the nations by language. And so 11 speaks of division. It speaks of basically, in a sense, confusion, some argue, or even the idea of basically chaos or disorder, putting it into chaos or disorder. So here we have 11 curtains being drawn together, speaking of disorder or judgment. 11 curtains. And the 11 curtains are made of goat hair, and here's how you're going to break them out. The length of one curtain shall be 30 cubits. The last ones were 28. So now instead of being 42 feet, they're 45 feet, which means they'll reach all the way to the bottom. Good, you're still with me. All the way to the bottom. In this rendition, you can see they have <clears throat> pulled the sides open. Some argue they may have done that during the hot part of the year. Uh, we don't know for sure. We don't have any direct mention as far as I know. Most agree it should be scraped down and draped. But once again, we'll take that in the 201 class in heaven. So you will make 11 of them. The length of it shall be 30 cubits. The breadth of it, one, one curtain, four cubits. So again, six feet wide. But now you have 11 of them. So now 11 times six is... 66 interesting feet. So it covers the entire length, 45, plus dropping down 15. There's 60. You have an additional six feet that hangs over the front door to the east. But then we're told in verse 9, you're going to double that front curtain, the sixth curtain, so you have only three feet that hangs down. Have I lost all of you? Is anybody still with me? Nope. There's not a single hand in the room. So the length of one cupid, cupid, curtain, 30 cubits, breadth of one curtain, four cubits, 11 curtains shall be of one measure. And you shall couple five curtains by themselves, remember God's grace, we think, and six curtains by themselves. Six is the number of sixth day God created man. Revelation 13, a false Christ rises. He uses the number of man, which is six. 166. Six, number of man. God's grace being joined with man. Eleven, judgment. Huh. Now, remember I said that they used goats here. How many have heard of Yom Kippur? Day of Atonement. Four or five of you? Okay, wonderful. What is the first sacrifice offered on Yom Kippur? There are two. And a lot is cast upon the two. One is sacrificed, the other is released. And they are goats. Not lambs, goats. Kid of the goats. What's our hair that was used here? Goat's hair. What do we have? Five and six. What is it? God's grace, number of man. Scapegoat, released. Goat that the lot falls on, sacrificed. And that is the first sacrifice for Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. What do we have now? Covering the very manifestation of glory and heavenly majesty is goat's hair. Again, five and six joined together. Judgment, 11. Interesting picture. So 
You will make it 50 loops on the edge, verse 10, of the one curtain that is utmost coupling, <clears throat> 50 loops on the edge of the curtain, which is coupling the second. Verse 11, and thou shalt make 50 tatches or clasps or hooks of brass. What's brass? Judgment. Judgment. Closest to the presence of God, gold deity. Away the next layer from the presence of God, judgment. Because you will not get into God's presence unless you deal with his judgment. Interesting. So here, brass, 50 clasps of brass, verse 11. And you will put the tatches into the loops and couple the tent together that it may be one. And the remnant that remaineth of the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remaineth, shall hang over the backside of the tabernacle. And again, it's folded, double folded, verse 9, on itself, leaving three feet hanging. And a cupid on the one side, and a cupid on the other side, that which remaineth in the length of the curtains of the tent, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side, and on that side to cover it. And then we have two more curtains, verse 14, but it's very short, the description. Now we get to the ram skin dyed red. Once again, you shall make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red and a covering above of badger skins. And obviously these are to match the previous ones, 11 curtains, 66 feet long, 45 feet wide, that cover the entire structure. Back to Yom Kippur. The first offering are two kids of the goats. Anybody want to guess what the second offering is? A ram. Ram skins dyed red. Heavenly glory taking again kingly majesty, laying down as a sacrifice, bloodshed. Sound at all familiar. So ram skins dyed red. Lastly, we get badger skins. This is takash in the Hebrew. Some argue it is dolphin skin. Others say it is Badger skin, some say sea cow skin, like a manatee, also known as the dugong. But this thing is the final covering again, 66 feet long, 45 feet wide, and it covers the whole structure. Here again, another representation, heavenly sort of woven first with the cherubim, then comes the goat skin, then comes the ram skin, then comes the sea cow skin, whatever it may be. And this is the front door veil, which we'll get into in a little bit. Once again, another depiction of what these would look like goat's hair, the ram skin, and the hide covering it. But if you look here on the right side, this sort of, you know, complete compound picture, to the outward observer, you come upon this thing sitting in some valley or plain, and if you're just from the outside looking in, what you see is just basically a rather unimpressive hide on top of what is essentially a, a tent. To look at it, you'd be like, eh, but go inside. You're going to blow your mind. Why do it this way? You know, how many of you, first service, they, they had hands because they're old enough? How many of you in the 70s and 80s pinstriped your car? Be honest. You paid for it. I have one hand, one honest person. Anybody else? Pinstripes? No? Change the rims, Craig or SS mags? Gold? Chrome? Spinning hubcaps? Anything? And why did you do that? Well, because, you know, you want to make it look good on the outside, right? In fact, you know, often you buy your first car, the whole thing's wrecked. But you try to, like, you know, get the, you know, try to clean it up, make it look good on the outside. And then you get in, you're like, Ugh, you know. God does the opposite. The outside, you go, eh. Get inside, your mind is blown. Now, you're already waiting for me in Isaiah 52. Because you knew this is where I was going to go. But once again, this tabernacle, speaking of a more clear fulfillment, as John's gospel said, the word was in the beginning. The word was God, the word was with God, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Isaiah writing this coming Messiah, this prophecy in chapter 52, verse 13, said, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many, verse 14, were astonished at thee, his visage, his appearance was so marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men, so shall he sprinkle many nations with his blood. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, Herod did, Pilate did. 
For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. And Isaiah cries out almost incredulously, Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord or his strength revealed? For he, the servant, shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form or comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him, just like this tabernacle, from the outside, average. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as our, were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Yet surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, think of the Day of Atonement, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. For what? Blasphemy. We thought he was getting what he deserved. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He goes on to say he was taken from prison, from judgment. Who would declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked, dying between two what? Thieves. And with the rich in his death, Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, and they shall make his soul an offering for sin. Sin offerings die, and they shed blood. He shall see his seed. Wait a second. How can he die and see those who follow him? Resurrection. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So this tabernacle is a foreshadow of when God himself in his own glory would take human flesh, walk among us, and then surrender his life to redeem us back. And his name is Jesus. Okay, so we have the ram skins, got that. Goat skins, got that. We got the linen, got that. And the sea cow skins, got that. Wonderful. Next item. And thou shalt make boards for the tabernacle of shittim or acacia wood, standing up. Ten cupids shall be the length of a board. That's 15 feet high. And a cupid and a half shall be the breadth of one. That's two and a quarter feet wide. And two tenons or two pegs shall there be in one board. Now, here's another depiction. But the idea of you've got this 15 foot high, two and a half feet wide, at the bottom are two basically pegs or posts that you then insert into what's at the bottom called a socket, and it gives rigidity and it keeps the structure together. And of course, there'll be some additional things to do that. So each one has two. They each sit in a socket. They sit next to each other. And in this depiction, they make the boards solid and covered in gold. If you're a woodworker here in the West, you think of oak, you know, ash trees, even cedar, others, you know, big boards, you know, sequoias, whatever, redwoods. Uh, but acacia trees, especially out in the wilderness, are not usually very big. It would be very hard to find this kind of solid board structure. Not impossible, but it would definitely take some effort. This is why some feel that it is actually a lattice work or a frame for framing out of wood, which would be a lot easier from a materials point of view and secondly, would make it much lighter to transport because this thing has to move. I am going to give you the opinion I think it's this, but I'll give a verse to show why I think it's this. For right now, let's just deal with this. Ten cupids shall be the length of a board, and a cupid and a half shall be the breadth of one board. Two tenons or pegs shall be in one board and set in order one against another. Thus shall you make for all the boards of the tabernacle. And thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle 20 boards. Again, back to the idea of does a number mean something? 10 completeness times 2, 20. So some argue it speaks of complete or perfect, in a sense, a complete or perfect union, or the idea of perhaps even a time of waiting, 20. Perfect time of waiting. But this, again, is put out there for you to play with. 20 boards. On the south side... 
So here's your south side, here's your north side, here's your west side, and here's the entrance from the east. 20 on the south side, boards on the south side. And thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver. Now you're thinking, you know, uh, snap-on tools, craftsmen. Not that kind of socket. Here's our boards, here's this lattice work, and then at the base, these things, sockets. And we'll get into how much they weigh later. 40 sockets. I think, honestly, the sockets actually overlap between board to board, and so two boards go, two different boards go into a socket, and that brings the, the strength that it needs, but you have 40 sockets. How long did it rain during the flood on the earth? 40 days, 40 nights. How long did the children of Israel, because of their rebellion, wander in the wilderness? 40 years. How long was Jesus tempted in the wilderness? 40 days. 40 is a number of testing or judgment or even probation or trial. So the idea of complete perfection or completeness being put on probation or trial. Gold, silver of deity, brass, silver of judgment, or um, metal of judgment, silver, metal for second place. Besides that, redemption, to buy back. So this is going to sound simple, but it's quite profound. The entire thing to know God's presence, to bring sacrifice, and to be, Lord, in, in some kind of relationship with him, the entire thing he gives them sits on redemption. This is all about redeeming man to himself. Wow. 40 sockets of silver. Two under each, one under each board, two tenions, two sockets, one to another under a board for his two tenions, verse 19, 40 of them, silver. And the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, there shall be 20 boards, and there 40 sockets of silver, verse 21, two sockets under one board, two sockets under another board, and for the sides, oh, we're going to get to those in a minute, too soon. For the sides of the tabernacle westward shalt thou make six boards, six the number of man, right? So back on our western side, six boards, okay? But then you also have to make two corners. Two speaks of union. Two become one. Two. So six boards, man, two boards, union, man, united again, and they sit on eight sockets at the bottom, or uh, hold on. Six boards plus two corners makes eight. Man in union, new beginning, eight. And so two boards shall you make for the corners thereof of the tabernacle on the two sides, verse 23. Verse 24, and they shall be coupled together beneath, and they shall be coupled together above. The head of it shall be one ring, thus shall it be for them both, they shall be for the two corners. And these shall be eight boards, new beginning, in their sockets of silver, redemption, 16 sockets. I don't know how they get this, but those who play with this say 16 speaks of love. Man, again in union with God, being redeemed, now enjoys his love. But play with that at home. 16 boards, or eight boards, 16 sockets of silver. Two sockets under one board, two sockets under another board. <clears throat> and thou shalt make, verse 26, ah, finally this, bars of gold. That's what you're seeing depicted here, these straight bars. Thou shalt make bars of shittim wood, five for the boards on the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the boards on the other side of the tabernacle, five boards, bars for the boards on the side of the tabernacle for the two sides westward, and the middle bar in the midst of the board shall reach from end to end. Thou shalt overlay the boards with gold. So here these guys go uh, solid boards, and they're supposed to have five, and you see how many? It's always easy to be a critic, isn't it? Here's another version. Here's the one at the eastern end, at the top as mentioned. Here along the sides, again, it's supposed to be five. And here's why I think it's a lattice work, because it said that one bar should go in the midst of the boards. So if it was a framework, they could literally bore, they could drill it and they could run it all the way through. And yes, they had drills, not power, not Bosch, not whatever else. Looks like a bow with a wooden stick and you, anyway, it takes a while. So they could drill through a middle bar. So I think it's a framework. But you shall put the middle bar, verse 28, in the midst of the boards, and shall reach from end to end. 
You shall overlay the boards with gold and make their rings of gold for places for the bars, and thou shalt overlay the bars with gold. And thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. You will make your copy just like the original that Moses saw in heaven. So now veils. And thou shalt make a veil of blue. Now this is enlarged just to give you some kind of detail, and I'll back off because I'm sure your eyes, you're already scheduling an eye appointment while you sit there, but... Shall make a veil of blue, again, heavenly glory, purple, royalty, majesty, scarlet, blood, the idea of life, fine twine linen, again, of cunning work, with cherubims shall it be made, and thou shalt hang it upon four pillars of shittim wood, overlaid with gold, their hooks shall be of gold, upon the four sockets of silver, so this sits on redemption, silver. And thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring in thither within the veil, the Ark of the Testimony, Ark of the Covenant. And the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place, which in Hebrew is Kodesh. Try it. Kodesh. Now you know what you hear. So if you go to Israel and see a sign with an arrow saying Kotel, not hotel, Kotel. What's it pointing towards? The area of the Western Wall. Kotel, Kodesh, holy. It's holy over there. Kodesh. So, holy place. It shall divide between the holy place and the most holy. Want to guess what that is in Hebrew? Kodesh, Kodesh. Twice. You see, when God repeats something, it's important. That's why when Jesus said, verily, verily, truly, truly, amen, amen, I say unto you, pay attention. Because when God repeats something, it's important. And so you have the Kodesh, the holy place, and you have the Kodesh, Kodesh, the most holy place. And thou shalt set the table without the veil, that table of showbread, on this side of this inner veil. And the lampstand menorah over against the table on that side, south side to the left, over against that side, the tabernacle toward the south. And thou shalt put the table on the north side. And thou shalt make a hanging for the door of the tent of blue, purple, and scarlet, fine linen wrought with needlework. So a second veil here at the entrance. Now we'll back it off so your eyes work again. Here you've got the first veil in the Holy of Holies, Kodesh, Kodesh. Behind it, the Ark of the Covenant. In front of it, the altar of incense. We'll get to later. Table of showbread, already covered it. Menorah to the south, left-hand side. Then you have a second veil here on the outside of the tabernacle. Don't let this idea here mislead you. It would hang over by three feet. For those who get into this area, this is the only clue you get of the glory inside. Once again, interesting as we look at this, this outer barrier here is seven and a half feet tall, which thankfully not just me, but most of you would be excluded from viewing. (laughs) At last, equality. So the only way to view this front door, this structure, is there's only one door in. Sound familiar? We're going to get to that later. And to come in, you must first deal with judgment, payment for sin. Payment for sin will then cleanse you. Having cleansed you, you now have the opportunity to enter. You see, you can't get into any sort of real relationship with God until you first deal with the judgment of your sin, which cleanses you before him. He was saying a lot through this structure. So, now our next thing. There shall be five pillars at the front door, and they sit on sockets or bases of brass. Brass is the metal of judgment. And there should be four pillars inside the structure leading into the Kodesh Kodesh, the Holy of Holies, and they are set on silver or redemption. So five pillars sitting on brass, judgment. Four pillars sitting on silver, redemption. Only one way in. You know, when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but by me. He was telling you, like this tabernacle, you want to be in God's holy presence. There's one way in. It's him. But now the question of why five and four. Well, how many books of Moses are there? Five. What do they tell us? Creation of man, fall of man, judgment of God upon man, the law of God that man might have some kind of relationship with him, 
And so those five books speak of not only the fall of man and the law, but the judgment that must come upon sin. Those five books talk about God's judgment. Four pillars. We have four gospels. And they talk in all four gospels of the redemption of man through the shed blood of the heavenly king who came down and laid his life down for us. The ultimate Yom Kippur. I think he's saying a lot. The books of Moses show you, you cannot please God. One commandment caused Adam and Eve to be ejected from the garden. Ten commandments, if you lie, that's it. False witness, that's it. Adultery, that's it. Covet, ooh, yep, that's it. Disobey your parents, (laughs) me too, that's it. All the five books can show you is you need an atoning sacrifice You need a redeemer. But even in these books, Moses prophesied and said, the Lord will raise up unto you a prophet like unto myself. And him you will listen to. And if you don't, God's going to require it. And Jesus came to be that one who sacrificed himself. So if you've accepted Christ as your savior, oh, just before he died, he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Old King James says he gave up the ghost. What happened next? The veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. His death immediately followed by the message from God. The way into his presence has now been made open through his death and his shed blood. So if you accept that in your heart, Jesus promises you have eternal life. And you have come to understand all that the law, the Psalms, and the prophets have foretold. But if you refuse to accept this, you're going to be left in darkness. And you're the one who chose. We're out of time. Pick it up here next week. See, you thought it was going to be boring. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. There is so much, Lord, I'm sure that you have yet in this that we have not even seen. Quite frankly, Lord, I think once we get to heaven and see from your perspective what you were doing, incredible number of times you were trying to speak to people about their sin. You make it clear as the judge of all the earth, you're going to leave men and women without excuse. So right now, Lord, I pray for anyone sitting in the room or listening later who are trying to excuse away surrendering their life, that today they would hear your voice right in their heart. They would not harden it and turn into unbelief, but they would do what the scripture says. They would confess the Lord Jesus with their mouth. They would believe in their heart. You raised him from the dead. As Isaiah prophesied, that in doing that in their car, at home, or sitting with their iPad, they would finally be saved. Thank you for revealing these things and preserving it for almost 6,000 years, Lord, for our study. In Jesus' name. Amen.